So today we have Ben Wormeller and and I've followed Ben's work for quite a while when he started with uh, Known with Aaron Joe Ritchie, if I remember the name correctly. We had conversations my students were using um, Known for blogging. I set up a connected classroom where I try to get my students to blog about their assignments in the open as opposed to hand it into a professor that may or may not read their assignment and give out their points. So um, a lot of my followers and, and people that know Ben know about connected classrooms. And so I was wondering, Ben, how do, how do we get students, you know, baby steps past that stage of I'm just handing in for one versus I'm writing my thoughts out on the open internet and yes. anyone could see it. Maybe I'm scared. Um, how do I, you know, find my voice when I'm blogging? Yeah, I mean, and it's a really hard question. I've had a lot of people ask me that over the years, and I think I was sort of lucky in a way because I kind of started with, uh, you know, posting on like Usenet as a teenager, which uh, really, if I had a teenager now, I'd be like, don't do that. But <laughs> it's, um, it's nonetheless, like it means that I've got very little filter. And right. a lot of people tell me, like, I just put myself out there. Um, I think it's about actually less blogging than writing. Okay. Like if you're writing something, how do you reveal something of yourself, right? Not necessarily your, you know, personal information, right. but actually who you, who you are, right. right? And so, you know, what a, it, blogging is much less about here's what happened and much more about here's what I think about what happened. Mm -hmm. And finding that, um, finding that ability to, to actually put out your opinions like that, uh, I think can be really hard for people. I think a lot of people assume that it's permanent, that you're right. just gonna be, um, you know, you're essentially carving it in stone uh, when, you're, when you're writing on a blog. And the truth of the matter is, uh, people's attention spans, particularly right now, mm -hmm. when um, the news cycle lasts about 25 minutes, it's, um, you know, you can write something and absolutely it's going down, going down the river and maybe it'll never be seen again. Right. And that's both good and bad. Like it's kind of um, the good part of that is you really don't need to be worried about uh, your opinion being indelible. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can, you're allowed to change your mind. You're allowed yeah. to change as a person. You're allowed to grow as a person. Um, and you know, the bad part is um, if you're audience driven, if you actually want people to uh, keep reading, you better, you know, start up a writing practice very, very quickly. And be consistent. And, and be consistent though, on a regular cadence. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but it's, you know, it's, I think it's much more about blank page syndrome than it is about blogging as such. I love that because sometimes in, well, students, and, and I, I always replace the word students with humans, um, mm -hmm. tend to, when there's a deadline, it, they, they enter that Calvin and Hobbes panic mode of, uh, you know, I wait till the deadline's there and then all of a sudden I've got the motivation. Whereas often it's just that blank page syndrome. Like once you get started and you've opened up uh, the documents start writing it flows out but you spend like a day or two or hours worrying about getting started whereas when you just get started it, it sometimes just comes out yeah and yeah so maybe, and think, maybe the the cadence yeah. has something to do with getting it more regular i think so and kind of caring much less about uh form like we're we all know kind of what an essay looks like or you know hopefully we know what an essay looks like and kind of <laughs> what the uh it's boring what the, well, what the, yeah, and what the structure of a long-form uh, piece of content looks like. Right. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. It really doesn't. And I don't even that. want it to be that. I want creativity. I want your own right. voice. Like, and in some ways, the cadence is more important than the, um, than the, than, than the length of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's totally okay. Like, if your update is um, 100 words long, fantastic. Like, if that's what you want to say, mm -hmm. great. Like, there's... Um, I think about, I think it's uh, Life, the Universe, and Everything, the third uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book. But there's like a chapter that's maybe six words long. Right. And it's fine. That works. Whatever. Whatever works in your context. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and getting out of that kind of formal, uh, that kind of formalized box for what you think writing should be, uh, I think I, th I think is important there too. I like that because um, right now there's a software engineering management course I'm giving. And, and just to give a spin on it, I'm using, there's a Tom DeMarco book called The Deadline, which is not a great novel, but it's a novel about software engineering management. 
So it, it has a different spin. They're reading it. I mean, it's not great character development or anything, but they learn concepts of software development while reading this novel. And so I'm bunching it into a couple chapters, write a post. And, and I was talking to them last night and I said, if you didn't really like this chapter or two chapters or whatever you're posting on, it's okay. Just make it a small one and say, didn't really like it. I'm not, I don't have the emphasis or, or the need to write that much about this one. And maybe the next one's a big deal. Like you don't have to give me the same depth each time. So I also think though, like the, the most important question you can ask in writing and software development is why. And so if you didn't, if you didn't like it, why didn't why? you like it? Yeah, so like, spin it around. Spin it around. Like, and there's the, you know, in, in user research, you have like the six whys, where you just keep asking why to get to the, um, the or is it the five whys? Might be the 19 whys, doesn't matter. You, get, <laughs> you keep asking why until you get, to the, um, uh, you get to the core of it. And I think, you know, there's something to be said, um, you know, for writing and for software development, like understanding why you are writing, what you're writing, why you're thinking about it in the way that you're thinking about it, why you're being asked to do it in the case of software development uh, in a particular way. It's the same, it's actually the same process. Right. And the um, and there's something to be said for really reflecting and building up a, a practice of, of, of reflection um, sure. that I think helps you in all kinds of areas. I love that. And, and that leads me down that path then, Ben. Um, as both a software developer and a writer, um, I, I try to point my students to people that are in this field and writing uh, and how that helps them. How do you think there's some kind of synergy there being a software developer and being a writer about what you're thinking on, what you're working on? Is it, does it help? I, th I, think, I think it helps massively. I think being able to um, structure your thoughts will help you structure your code. And it doesn't mean that you have to come into it being a great writer, mm -hmm. but the more you practice, you'll actually find that your coding practice um, improves as well. It is it is the same thing. You are building essentially a narrative out of code when you're writing software. Um, and so it can really help to think about the structure and think about kind of the, the process of writing separate from you know learning the mm -hmm. syntax and algorithms of code, right? And then you, when you marry the two together, you can, um, uh, you can find the, the you know, you, that's when you really discover that they, they, they really do go together. And I think the greatest uh, software developers I know uh, are also fantastic writers. Some of them are actually, not all of them are fantastic writers. Some of them are fantastic artists or musicians, yes. right? But yes. very, very often they have this other practice that actually, um, you know, it's mutually beneficial. The, the two things help each other. Well, coding is artisan, definitely. There's so many, there's so many shops that yeah. have, they're not just one band, but two or three. I mean, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Richard Gabriel through my work with Uppsala over the years. And, and in his book, he talks about the, the bands they had set up when they were doing the, doing the work in their projects. Um, so there's, I, 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 I hate to use the word brand, so I'm not, I'm trying to think of the, it's a better word of like, your persona, your visibility on the internet writing, how can that help um, budding software engineers that are studying right now kind of open up doors for them going forward looking for work? Yeah, um, simply put, your website is an insight into how you think. Yeah. So the more you can show your working and how you think, the, uh, the more doors you'll open for yourself. And to be really concrete about it, I can tie every major career progression in my life to blogging. Yeah. Um, so I, I was blogging, I'm 41 years old. I was blogging in, um, from 1998. Uh, I'm not going to do the math and figure out how old, how old uh, I was right. when that started. Cause, cause that's depressing, but like 21. <laughs> I, I, um, yeah. So I was, you know, what happened was, um, so for, I used to work on a project called Elk. That was kind of the first major um, career development for me. And I was just, you know, I was a computer science major. I graduated from the University of Edinburgh. I then went to work for the University of Edinburgh. And maybe um, I would have been working, you know, I know people who were working there then. 
uh, in that in the media and learning technology department who are still there, and that's fine. That's a wonderful job. But the um, you know my writing led to some ideas about uh, social media and learning that turned into uh, you know had some meant that some people replied to me and like they and my uh, co-founder Dave and we kind of built up a, a, a wider conversation and it led to um, my first startup, a platform that was used by one in seven universities and the, uh, you know, was used as the intranet for the government of Canada, probably. And, uh, you know, and a, and a bunch of other things. And it all came from just putting my ideas out there. And actually, the next role I had after that, the next big progression I had after that, it was similar. It was because I was writing all the way through Elk and sharing, you know, sharing my work. And frankly, et cetera, all the way up until now. I, exactly. I found it enormously beneficial. And the more you put yourself out there in terms of who you are and how you think, uh, the more people are likely to connect to you and really respond to how you think. Um, and again, like you don't have to go into it being, in, you know, incredibly um, descriptive. You don't have to, you know, come into it being an expert at blogging. But mm -hmm. over time, you'll build up that, um, that expertise. And what's cool about it is even when you're putting something out that is, you know, turns out to be wrong, turns out to be, you know, not quite the right thing, people will just respond to you, sure. they'll chat with you. Um, and, uh, and you actually meet people that way as well. It's been, you know, that can be really fun. I had a um, back and forth with a guy who I just completely disagreed with back in the day about kind of the future of social networks and open source and that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I just thought that um, his ideas were nonsense. He thought that my ideas were nonsense. We became great friends. It worked out really, really well. And, um, you know, there's no harm in putting something out. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest harm is actually just in um, keeping yourself, keeping yourself reserved. As long as you're not, uh, you know, there are, let's be clear, as long as you're kind, right? Right. You're Thank open you. to new ideas and you are, um, you know, and you maintain a level head. So, right. you know, as soon as we start getting into shouting at each other, right. as soon as we start getting into, uh, obviously expressing hate, right. right. Uh, in all its different forms, uh, that's when it becomes really problematic, but probably, probably, you know, um, more likely than not, you don't have hateful views. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a good person, you're a thoughtful person and uh, putting yourself out there is going to be, uh, is going to be productive. There is one other caveat, which is unfortunately, uh, the world is not what we wish it would be. And uh, there are demographics of people who will attract um, some, who may attract, uh, unwanted attention from from certain people on the internet and they may find that they have hate directed at them so i, I want to acknowledge that because yeah. it's uh it's a privilege to not be subject to that yeah um and there are ways around it we have better um we have better uh kind of moderation and reporting mechanisms than we ever have Com yeah. uh, internet companies are more responsive uh mm -hmm. to those problems than they ever have been uh, and there are things you can do, you know, it's why, um, you know, controlling your own website rather than uh, right. putting your identity uh, in a place that's subject to, for example, Facebook's rules or Twitter's rules right. uh, is, uh, could be important because it means that you can decide exactly uh, what you feel comfortable sharing of yourself uh, and it's not under someone else's jurisdiction. Right, own your domain and own your space. And, and I can, I, I talk to my students a lot about that and anyone who looks at Ben's work will, will find that as well. Um, I pointed them to a recent post you made about uh, blogging in 2020, uh, which which Stephen left a comment on, Stephen Downs and other people are there at the bottom. It was really a, a great piece. Um, and I love that you talked about um, vulnerability because it's really important, Ben. And when I first started doing this, I left out that part. Um, with my students and I, and I needed to be really clear and upfront about some of you might suffer this and I need to let you know ahead of time and it's not your fault and um, let you know what can happen and that please come to me and, and I can help you if something like that does happen on, on your blogs because as educators using this tool um, I think we, a lot of us learn the hard way that we need to have that discussion ahead of time 
about what can happen. And then I also give my students an opt out. If they don't want to do this at all, then fine. We'll just go back to, you know, write something up and send it directly to me. So um, anything else you wanted to add, Ben? Because I don't really want to use a lot of your time. And um, this has been great. Um, I think this is excellent, excellent information for my students and hopefully other students. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's just fun. I think um, just really want to double underline platform um mm -hmm. actually Good. which um now the first thing is like i think it's more important to write and put yourself out there than the platform mm -hmm. is that you put yourself out on that said um like i said i started blogging in 1998 um i don't know how many web services that were around in 1998 are still around but i don't think it's very many like amazon Google, uh, Google started in 98, right? That, that kind of thing. So the, it's much better to have your own site. Um, and there are some, like nobody has actually made it easy to uh, have your own site. I would love to be able to say, yeah, it's just two clicks, please get started. And that's just not the case. Um, and web hosts, uh, like there are wonderful web, web hosts out there in the world. Not a single one of them is, you know, two, cl two clicks easy. No. Uh, and so there is, and, and it costs money. So there's like, there's, there's a barrier for sure. Yep. But it's, but having that domain and having that website, uh, if you can do it, if you have the means to do it, it's um, insulation against changes on the internet, right? As companies come and go, as uh, Twitter changes its platform, Facebook changes its platform, Instagram, TikTok, right? All of those places, as they as they change their platforms, uh, you'll have to change too. Whereas on your own site, you know, you, you can do whatever it. you want. Yeah, and there's no reason why you can't be on those platforms. In addition, but having that central place uh, where you where you post, where you really represent yourself on your own terms, and you uh, have control of your data. They don't just you know go away, and all of a sudden, all of your posts are gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. You you absolutely have control of your data. You have control of the form of your data, and you've got control, most importantly of all, uh, over your identity online. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what happens over time is that site becomes, when people search for you, it becomes the thing that they see, and they see this body of work, they see what you think about, how you think, who you are, much, much better than any other social media profile could possibly do. And that's, uh, that's really, really key. It just, um, it's sort of like the, I don't know uh, if you've gone over what network effects are, but it's like the network effect of you, right? Yeah. You are, the more you put into it, the more valuable it becomes. And it's something that can stay with you and grow and change and, uh, you know, visually and, and in terms of its content over time. But it's something that, uh, that will stay with you and will really be uh, the thing that represents you on the internet, which is just going to get more important. Lovely. And it's nice to have your own history, even just do paper journaling, being able to go back in time sure. 20 years and look at, oh, what was Ben like back in whatever time? So it's a wonderful thing to do. I've got colleagues that have been blogging that long. And it's amazing to just go back and see old posts of your own and see what, yeah. you, what your thoughts were. So I love that. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for this. And, and also, I, um, I, I say to my students, reach out to people because um, I remember reaching out to you and say, hey, Ben, um, we're going to use this thing for my class and could we talk? And then you set up a Google, uh, a Google Meet at the time and, and we had a conversation with you and Aaron Joe and, and you were so open um, and, and I'd give you bug reports and you'd, you'd reply really quick. And I'm like, look, guys, I told Ben there's a problem and he's like fixing it right now. It's really awesome. So um, I think it's important that people think they can reach out to people and, and sometimes they won't answer, but a lot of times they will. And it's great. So how, how would people find Ben on the internet? So my personal website where I blog is uh, word with an E. So W E R D dot I O. Uh, fun fact, think about your domain a little bit because it was a full two years before I realized that that was a misspelling of weirdo. And that's how everyone else thought of it. Oh, my man. last name is word Muller. I just, I was just like, it's word input or output. That's, yeah, works. Anyway. So it, 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 it works in both cases. Yeah. But <laughs> um, yeah, so take a look there. You'll find my email address. You'll find my links to other profiles. Uh, that's the best place to find me. And I would love, love, love to hear from you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ben, and you have an excellent day and an excellent weekend. You too. Thank you so much.